Hi, folks. Um, so, I'm Enrique. I have been a game developer who has been making games far longer than I care to remember. And I know I don't look that old, as Slava was mentioned earlier, so let's put that down to good beer and good jeans and good games. Um, so I started my journey as a game designer and a developer when I was around 13 years old and coding for the old 8-bit computer called ZX Spectrum, selling my games in cassette tapes to friends at school, and later I became a developer for another machine called the Amiga, where I was part of the demo scene, pushing the limits of the hardware at the time. So my passion and expertise, though, is multiplayer game design. Uh, my first multiplayer game was back in the 90s called a uh, multi-user dungeon, or a MUD, made for BBSs before the internet came along. Um, people have to dial into my server and connect their modems into it so they could play with another four or five people adventuring. So MUDs are the grandfathers of MMORPGs like World of Warcraft. So you get an idea how complex the design of, uh, of a MUD and these kinds of games are. And as a designer, I have created a lot of uh, online games, such as trading card games, online strategy games, and I won a couple of awards for these games. Uh, Monstermind uh, won a best online game, BAFTA, for that. Um, today, I have my own studio, this Boss Studios, and also the chairman of Tiny Build, who I'm sure everybody here knows fairly well. And in my spare time, I'm a maker. I make computers. I rebuild old computers, and I launch uh, ZX Spectrum Next, which is the successor of the ZX Spectrum. And some of the games I worked on over the years, you've probably heard of. Uh, RuneScape, or FIFA, or Surgeon Simulator, I Am Bread and I Am Fish, games from Boss Studios. I had the, the, the privilege to work on around 40 games throughout my career so far, and some of them did very well, became successes, and sold millions of copies. So it's fair to say that I have achieved my childhood dream of becoming a game designer and making games, and this is probably why I have been brought here today to speak to you. Uh, Boss at the studio I work at uh, has made all sorts of games, from mobile to PC to consoles to VR. Uh, we game jam a lot, and through those game jams, we have gone through around 300 prototypes over the last few years. Uh, and thanks to this rich output, I have remained up to date with game design, working with other game designers at the studio pretty much on everything we ever made. This is important to point out because I don't want you to think that the last time I made a game was 20 years ago, and I'm a bit outdated. That, thankfully, is not the case. I remain very much in the game, and uh, I design games to this very day, uh, but now with the, with the help of people who are much more talented than I am. Right? And this design work has resulted in winning a lot of awards, which is incredibly rewarding for myself and the team, but the awards don't, don't matter that much. What matters is that they vindicate our approach to game design, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is we always, always start with a core design, with a core concept, with a core mechanics, even before we talk about characters, world building, levels, or settings, or anything like that. It's all about the mechanics first. And through this methodology, we have been very successful. The advantage of being around for so long as I have is, is that I have worked with a lot of different people who employ different tools. So today I'm going to show some of these tools and explain why I think they are useful, why they think there's value on them, right? Uh, I collected all these tools over the years, and some of them are very good, some of them will be obvious to some of you, some of them will be completely new, and I hope that at least you, you leave today with at least one of these tools in your pocket and you can use it on a day-to-day, -day, right? But just before we dive into these tools, uh, I wanted to share a definition with you. It is, why is it that we play games? Because going through that part first and having established the same kind of lingo will help us uh, walk each one of these tools. So, games have been with us since the dawn of humankind. The first documented game, called it Senate, uh, dates back to more than 3,000 years before Christ. And most games, as most games ever since, is a social activity that two people have to play together for it to happen, right? So it's fair to say that we have been playing games for at least 5,000 years, probably more, because there are indications that the Sumerians have been playing games 8,000 years ago. But that's not even to say that we haven't been playing games even longer than that, right? Actually, the likelihood is that we have been playing games even before we were considered to be humans, before we branched out into being homo sapiens. And the reason I believe that is the case 
is because most mammals play in some shape or form. They play games with themselves, they play games with tools. Some of these can be very simple simulations, like uh, a dog pretending to be fighting with another dog or pretending to be hunting. Uh, some could be very more, uh, far more advanced, like uh, the two dolphins here playing with a puffer fish, using it as a ball. And they are almost playing like a form of football with a puffer fish, right? If you have dogs or cats, you have seen them play with sticks, with balls, uh, with your dirty socket, it doesn't matter. But this is to say that play is in our nature, right? It's a great way to learn, a great way to be entertained, but we cannot escape it because it's embedded deep in our brains. Another reason why we play games is to develop strategy to optimize tasks and deal with challenges. You see, the, the brain is this super hungry organ. It burns calories just by thinking, and there's no, no activity you can do that will burn more calories than just thinking deep, right? 20% of our energy capacity is spent by your brain. So the brain is always looking for ways to avoid burning too many calories, just in case you run out of food, right? Of course, nobody runs out of food here, but back in the time we were hunter-gatherers and this brain that we carry with us was evolving, that was still a concern. So this means that when you optimize a task, we use less energy to do it, and when we do that, the brain is happy. It gives you a burst of dopamine and you feel rewarded by it, right? Uh, a good example I use is road crossings. How many times have you seen people making a dangerous crossing on a street or a road rather than walking a few uh, feet or a few yards down the line to cross uh, the, the pedestrian passage, right? The reason why a lot of people do that is because the brain refrains from going through the long path. It wants to go to the short path, to the point that in some countries, like Japan, uh, they have diagonal crossings because so many people avoided going through the left and right, that they just gave up and say, let's paint the stripes in the diagonal and let people cross where they want, right? This is the brain optimizing every single thing that it does. This is the brain telling you that you should save energy, that you should shortcut, that you should go. And when you do that, when you automate a task, when you learn how to fire a gun in the game that you don't even think anymore, you just point and, and, and fire, that becomes satisfying. The brain rewards you. So understanding why we play games is a question intrinsically related to what your brain wants, right? It wants to run simulations so it knows what to do in real situations, such as dealing with risks and threats. This is why you like games that you shoot, because, I don't know, maybe shooting one day, your brain is always thinking, now I know how to shoot, right? You want to optimize the tasks, so use less energy in order to survive longer with the food that you have available. And you want you to get access to more things that you did before, so reduce the risk of starvation. And that is linked to progression in games, right? I am achieving th things, I am collecting things, I have more than I had before. So that has to do with the brain wanting to stash, to hoard. Right? And this is why you're happy when you find a better weapon in a game. You use less energy because you have to shoot less times. Now the gun is more powerful and I kill more people with that gun, or I jump higher with, with the boots or whatever. And uh, you feel safer because you are in domain of the things that you have at, uh, at your hand, right? I have mastered the jumping, I have mastered the running, I now feel safer, I feel less threatened. This is the brain uh, 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 telling you that you're doing a good job. And this is what I find so cool about games, and this is why games are so appealing to people, and it's an industry the size that it is, because it brings together all the things that our brains like the most. Everything that our brains reward us for being is right there in the game. The game is running simulations, is letting you progress, is teaching you things, is letting you optimize things and optimize tasks. This is why games are so successful. So, onto the tools. I have broken down the tips and tools into domains, such as balance or feedback and pillars, so we organize our thinking about these. And I will start with uh, the journey with um, what we call structure. Structure are basically tips and tools that um, that help you structure your own work as a game designer, right? It's stuff that you can do on a day-to-day -day that will make your life easier or more practical or give you better results when you are designing a system or, or a mechanic, right? The first tip I got for you is uh, uh, design and implement just one system or mechanic at a time. Don't design two or three features on paper and create a big design document at GDD before you had the time to test the first one because you might be tempted to fix a problem on the first one by changing the second or the third or the fourth mechanic afterwards, right? And you will never know after that where exactly the problem is. So you'll be designing around the problem. 
it's much better for you to create a mechanic, test it isolated, and make sure that it is fit for purpose. And if there is a problem, you can fix or replace, etc. before you start building things on top. I know this sounds very obvious, but you'll be surprised by how many times I have seen people designing systems and just moving from one mechanic to another while there is a crucial problem in a core mechanic that they will only figure out that has to be solved down the line. And that has a cascade, a domino effect on everything else. Right? The second one is a very dangerous one, which is the sunken cost fallacy, which is a risk not only to game designers, but to game developers just as well. The more time you have invested into a mechanic in creating something, right, the more tempted or resistant you will be to throw it away. And more often than not, the best solution to fix a broken game design or broken game mechanic is to throw it away and start from scratch. Not always, but it happens far more often than, than you, you being successful trying to fix it. So be mindful to not get too in love or too enamored with a game mechanic before you have proven that it works. Because otherwise, you, you're running the risk of this sunken cost fallacy. I invested so much time into it, I can't go back, I can't throw it away. There has been too much investment going on here. Um, but fine, if you want to ignore those two tips, be my guest, you can do so. But whatever you do, never, never ignore the tip number three, which is don't try to fix a game mechanic or a system with another additional game mechanic or a system. Again, this is very common in, in game design and production, especially in new teams, right? Doesn't work quite well. Ah, what if we added this other feature to fix that problem? You don't do that. That is the, that's the worst way for you to deal with game design and it leads down terrible, terrible outcomes. The best thing you can do is just take your time, go back and fix that mechanic in itself. If it has a problem, it has to be fixed or scratched and started again. You can never design another mechanic to fix it or your game will not feel quite right. It will always feel a little bit junk or something quite a bit out of place. Um, and lastly, the father of all bad games you have ever played, I guarantee you, is thinking that your game is gonna be fun when. I'm playing my game right now, it's not really fun, but when I add those two new features and I redo that other thing and I add that other level, the game will become fun, right? That seldom works. It, uh, like disclosure, I have seen games in development that were a complete disaster until the last minute everything came, came back together and the game became great. Right? But that is so rare and usually only happens when very experienced teams that know what each other are doing, they are just working on their own stuff and then it fits. But that's very rare and usually it happens in iterations of a game like number two and number three of an IP. When you're creating something new and you're working on it and it's not fun, Chances are you will not get fun with the more stuff you add, right? So make sure that your game is always from, from day one. Everything you, you're going through a game development where you and your, your partners and your colleagues, you launch the game every day, you play a little bit and it's fun every single day. Gives you the reassurance that you're working on the right thing. Gives you the reassurance that you're building on top of something which is cool. Thinking that's gonna be fun down the line creates a horrible sense in the team that, oh my God, will it? Uh, how we are also are actually working on something good will actually be good at the end, and you don't want to run into that. I will give you an example of a game that we worked on. Uh, we have been playing these party games like uh, Fall Guys uh, uh, and so on, and we decided that for whatever reason, most of the party games we tried, the controls felt floaty. It didn't feel very tight. I didn't feel like I was in total control of my character. So we decided, oh, let's try to create a party game where the controls are everything, that you feel like you are in control of the game. And this is how this prototype started its life, Room of Doom. Before we made any level, before we knew what the setting of the game was like, before we had artwork done for the game, anything, we were already working on more than 20 parameters for the controls, like coyote time, how much you stay before you fall, how long you jump, your speed, etc. cetera. And, and we tweaked these values like hundreds of times before we got to a result that we just, in this prototype, with nothing, just this blue guy walking around, it was fun. It was super cool to jump, super cool to run, super cool to bounce. Then we started to build a game around it, right? And the, the result was that every single day that we got to the studio and launched this game to, to, to test what we did on the day before, we had fun. We were laughing at each other, we were saying, ah, oh, this is great, etc. And we ended up with a fairly good prototype. We were very happy with it. And the development was much shorter than we anticipated because we didn't have to go back and rework on anything, that the core of the game was super sound, super uh, uh, tight, and we knew what we were doing. 
There was never a time during the development of this prototype that we were biting our nails and thinking, oh, will it actually be a good game in the end? We knew all along that it was a good game. The second uh, realm is uh, what we call pillars, right? I know most of you are familiar, but I will go deep a little bit on what a pillar is and why it's so important. Pillars are ideas and concepts you establish early on the stage of your development that will guide every single decision you and everyone else in the team makes, from art to development to QA and, and design. Uh, they are super important to keep the game on track. They are super important to uh, limit uh, feature creep and to keep you on objective looking ahead. So let's look at a few tips in the pillar area. Uh, the first one is that there's nothing more important in game development than establishing the pillars. I guarantee you. There's nothing more important in any game project than establishing the pillars early on. The second one is there are endless potential in exponential mechanics, which in turn require a pillar to be in place. Third is that mechanics, game mechanics that you can use in several different contexts are much more valuable than game mechanics that can only be used at once. And the only way for you to create mechanics that can be used in several different con con contexts is to have a game pillar to guide you through that. I know these concepts are very abstract and very complex uh, uh, to, to explain and understand, so I'm going to use real-world examples to illustrate what I mean. Okay? Uh, Miyazaki, the Japanese game designer and producer that created the Dark Souls series and the Elder Ring, he was once stuck with a flat tire on a uh, uh, snowstorm, right? He was stuck there, couldn't get his car moving, he was freezing. A few strangers stopped by, helped him with his car, fixed the car for him, and then they went away. They disappeared into the snowstorm. That gave Miyazaki the idea that summoning players to help me to deal with a problem. That is the pillar of the Dark Souls series. Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Elder Ring, Bloodborne, all these games, right? summoning another player to deal with a problem that I have, which is inspired on his flat tire in the middle of the snowstorm, is the main pillar of the Souls series. Now, think about how much of those games, all those games, go back to this simple definition. The games are super hard. Everybody who talks about these games says, oh, it's the hardest games there are. They are hard because if you are stuck and you cannot get through a challenge, you can summon someone to help you and you will get through, right? All the things that are written on the floor, that's because you can summon other players, so why not I leave a note, right? The difficulty of the bosses, they're super difficult because you can deal with them with another player. The weapons are balanced against that, the level design is made against that, so the whole game goes back to this one pillar, which is I can summon a player to help me when I have a problem. That is how powerful a game pillar can be. It will guide every subsequent decision, every design mechanic that you have throughout your entire development, right? Sorry, I should be passing on the slides here. So you can summon a player, and then you deal with the bosses. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, another one is, is when we talk about uh, um, exponential mechanics, which eventually lead to emergent gameplay. Um, let's think about this for a second. A designer in Minecraft at some point decided that we will add electricity to the game. We add a, a, power, a power source to the game, right? Um, so they created the redstone. To begin with, the redstone was just intended to push a piston or to propel a cart or do something simple like that, right? But because it worked with every single other mechanic in the game, the next thing you know, People were building games inside Minecraft, right? Tetris or computers, etc., and that transformed the entire game. So Minecraft, it is the game that it is because every mechanic that Notch and his team implemented into the game worked with every other single mechanic, and that's the power of exponential mechanic, right? Because if I have four mechanics and I add a fifth one, I don't now have five mechanics. I now have 16 new mechanics because that can interact with every one of the other four and unlock exponential between the four themselves. Like, the fire in Minecraft is not only to lit a torch or to cook a meal, right? It can spread, it can set a, a house on fire like on Alex's presentation yesterday on the video. That is just because that's an exponential mechanic. It's not restricted to just one use, right? And then you have mechanics that have multiple uses. And a good example for this is the doors in Faster Than Light. It's just a door. You can lock it, you can unlock it, you can open it and close it. But 
Faster Than Light made it so that giving the player control over locking, unlocking, opening, and closing, there are so many things a door does in that game. I can close a door into the ship and, and, close an, and open another door into space to vent the oxygen out. With that, I can put out fires, I can suffocate crew members or invaders, I can contain people inside the room so I can fire a missile there. So many mechanics of the game, which are uh, spaceship versus spaceship, right? Work with doors in that game. Because they were designed in a way that they touch every single other mechanic in the game. And that creates emergent gameplay. That creates things that were unexpected. That creates things that were not scripted, that didn't have to give you work. So think about these two examples that I used, right? The Minecraft and Faster Than Light. Why did I pick those two examples? Minecraft was initially designed by just one person, Notch. For a long time, it was just him making that game. And yet, it was a very deep and very, very playable game. Faster Than Light, just two people. The thing is, nobody has to write scripts for these games, nobody has to set full motion videos, nobody had to create a, a, a lot of content or narratives or things like that. No, just mechanics. These are the, powerful, the power of exponential and reusable mechanics. They can create games at very low cost. So if you are a small team, remember that. If you focus on game mechanics that can be reused and work into each other, you will create a much bigger game with fewer resources than if you go down the scripted, the kind of handcrafted way. Right? This, is, this is useful for, for special small teams. But of course, any game mechanic is only good at its balance. If its balance is broken, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So here's a, some tips to balance your game mechanics. On the first pass of a game mechanic, make it very hard. Very, very hard. Why? Because testers complain when something is hard. They never complain when something is too easy. So it's very, very, very practical for you to make it very hard and go down, than to make it easy and go up, because you won't have the feedback. Okay? So start hard and tone it down until you feel it is perfect. Don't start low. The second tip I learned from actually Sid Meier, who created Civilization, and uh, Will Wright, who made uh, uh, The Sims. When you change a value of something, like a weapon, a shield, or a jump height, etc., always double it or halve it. Don't do five, 10% tweaks. Go extreme, because then you will know what is the impact of a big change to your game. And if you keep on doing that, go high, go very low, go high, go very low, eventually you will find the sweet spot, and the sweet spot will be far more interesting than if you will go incremental, and then you stop and say, oh, this is good. You don't know if another 5% will be better, and another 10% will be exceptional. But if you go up and down like that, eventually you will hone in in the sweet spot, and your balance will be just right. Okay? And lastly, when considering game balance values, always frame it from the perspective of time. For instance, imagine a hero and an enemy, and they engage in a battle. They're fighting each other, okay? You as a game designer, how long do you want that battle to take? Do you want it to take a minute, 30 seconds, 10 seconds? Once you imagine and you picture that, and you know how long you want it to, make, to take, you just have to adjust all other values to stage that. And if you do that well, you can use spreadsheets to do that. I know this looks like a finance thing, and this is a very simple example. I, I, I will do it in real time, but the machine here doesn't allow me. But with something as simple as this, if I change the player health, I will immediately know in the end how much damage my enemy should be making. Or if I add more armor to the player from 10 to 20, that number on the end will change automatically. So instead of doing balance from your gut feeling or say, oh, let's do it 10, let's do it 20, etc., if you create spreadsheet formulas around your game values, the minute you tweak one of them, all the others tweak automatically via the formulas, and you know how to balance the game. And your developers can actually pull the data straight from the, from, from the spreadsheet into the game. You don't have to take them from hand and put in there. Right? You can export this, this as an XML or, or, or any other data format that you want, and they can pick it up and plug it straight into the game. So when you're balancing the game in real time, you don't even have to touch the code. You just go on the spreadsheet, change, the next version of the game is already balanced. The power of spreadsheets I cannot understate, especially when the game gets very complex and have a lot of variables. Being able to see them, the interrelations with them, change one and see everything else changing is really, really powerful and super cheap. Of course, spreadsheets are very boring, but they're a tool. Now, you got your game mechanics into the game. You need to validate them. You need to know 
what the players think about them. That, and that comes with data and testing. Like Sun Tzu, when he wrote The Art of War, they, he taught us that how important information is in order to win a battle. And game design is no different. If you don't know how your players are dealing with your game, if they like what they don't like, how they, they, they perform inside the game, you just can't make it better. Because as a game designer, you completely lost perspective. You have been close to your game for too long. You need your players. So the first tip is to test and validate your game mechanics using paper testing when possible. You can use dice, you can use paper units, you can use traditional uh, tabletop pieces, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's very cheap to test game mechanics on paper. Not every game mechanic can be tested on paper, but at least every game mechanic can be tested on spreadsheets, which we spoke about before. So there are ways for you to test a game mechanic before you hand over to your fellow developer to implement them, and you know how expensive it is to implement a game mechanic into a game. So the more you can test it on paper and spreadsheets before you do that, the better your team will run. Uh, second, make sure that your prototype is being tested by new players all the time. You gotta have this steam of new players walking into your game because fresh players will give you clear feedback on difficulty because the old players will be used to the prototype and everything will be easier for them. And they will always come with fresh ideas. Fresh players bring fresh ideas. So keep coming, keep adding players to your player base, to your prototype, and sometimes even phase out the old players. If you create a player group and stay with it from start to finish, you will lose perspective uh, of what's actually going on for the new players that will be playing your game when you release it, right? And lastly, uh, the more data you collect, the better. But there is such thing as too much data. Be aware of that. Uh, it can lead you to paralysis, to confusion. And if you have too much data, you can actually justify any decision with that much data, right? It's, of course, things like DAU or playtime and retention are all great, but these things don't tell you what you need to fix. They only tell you there is a problem. If my retention is low, okay, I'm losing players, why? Right, you don't know. It tells you there is a problem, but doesn't tell you how to fix it. In my experience, the one tool that serves designers and producers the most to fix problem, identify where the problem lies, are heat maps, right? Heat maps are far easier to implement and far more powerful to, to, to help you hone down on where a problem lies. I will give you an example of how this works. This is uh, the heat map in 3D for uh, Subnautica from Unknown Worlds. Basically, they sliced the game world into cubes, right? And each cube changed colors depending on how much time a player spends inside that cube. So if the player don't spend any time at all, the, the cube will be blue, if you spend some time is green, you spend a lot of time is yellow, and spend bloody a lot of time is red. So you will see there in the middle, there's a lot of red because that's the area that the player starts the game on. So they will usually build their bases around there, they will scavenge for a lot, they will learn the game in that area, so it's all red. That's all obvious. But you also see to the right, there is that big green uh, uh, arm with some yellow and some red at the end of that arm. And that is a problem because there's nothing there. There's no game design, there's no resources, nothing at the end of that arm. And the game designers were asking themselves, why the hell is people swimming to that point? Why are they going there? Why so many people spending time there when there's no quest, no, no, no piece of lore, no uh, um, resource or anything like that? Well, the answer was, that was the skybox where the crashed ship was on. It's just a skybox. It was painted in the sky. But the player was swimming there to find out if there's something there, the ship was there. So when they saw that many players doing that, what they did, removed that from the skybox, created a level with the crashed ship, and put it into the game. So Subnautica was made into the game, there it is, with the ship crashing and all that levels inside the ship that became a big part of the game because of the heat maps. If they didn't have the heat maps, the ship would have remained a skybox, and Subnautica would be a poorer game for that. Heat maps are super easy to implement. Any developer can do. It can, use, it can be used to how many time people spend, or how many time people die where, where they are, and you create a heat map for that, or how many things they collect, or how many points they make, how many things they kill, how many times they shoot. All of that can be turned into, into heat maps. And seeing the game through the lenses of heat maps will tell you when there is a problem. When people are spending too much time somewhere, when they're spending no time at all in a place that you wanted, all through the heat maps. So if you have to collect one type of data, do it through heat maps. Uh, lastly, I wanted to show you a tool that we use at the studio to evaluate a value of a game feature, even before we implement that feature into the game. 
Uh, we call it the PPP tool. It basically talks to pillars, player, and the promise, and promise are the features. Um, this is a very kind of simple way for a designer to be able to look at their work and say, is this good? Should I spend time doing this? Right? Uh, think of the PPP tool as a Swiss knife for uh, game designers that allow you to map every single feature you have to a player emotion, which in turn is related to a pillar. Okay? Let me show you how this works. Is readable, okay. Um, here's a crude example of a PPP applied to a game called Deep Rock Galactic. Deep Rock Galactic is not my game, it's a game that I like, and I did this exercise uh, creating this for the game as a player, okay? I did design that game. It is a co-op PV game with four dwarves dig into asteroids to collect precious minerals inside the asteroids and go back to their base to upgrade their weapons, etc. So if, if you haven't played this game yet, I recommend it. It's, it's a good game from a game design point of view, and it's fun to play. So first, what you do is that you list the, the, the pillars of the game, which is here on the left, right? Uh, if this was Dark Souls or Elder Rings, the top pillar would be, I can summon a player to help me out with this, okay? Um, in Deep Rock Galactic, those are the four that I think are correct. The first one is, is what makes the game unique. There are four dwarves in space, Usually you don't see dwarves in space, here you do. They are digging into asteroids and making jokes at one another while drinking beer, okay? This is what people see when they go on the Steam page and look at the game. That, that's just the face of the game, right? The second pillar is the main core of the game. It is a co-op game. Four of us specialize in different role, uh, roles. So I will be the tank, you will be the engineer, I will be the miner, I will be the healer, and uh, we go together to mine. That's, that's the core of the game. It's a, co-op PvE game, four of us against whatever is in the, those, those caverns that we're going to dig in. The third pillar is the main game loop, mining the asteroid for resources and richness that I can take back to my base with me, right? And lastly, the final pillar is that the game is skill-based. There is a lot of skill for the players. They need to learn how to better play the game with each other, and they need to unlock stuff on a tech tree to be able to do better weapons, better things, and, and, and evolve, right? So these are the four pillars. I then go and map against each one of these pillars three emotions that the player should be thinking about, should be feeling going through related to that pillar. So uh, let, let's pick up uh, um, the third pillar, right? In that pillar, the players must feel like they have to get as much resources as possible. The more they want, the deeper they will have to go. And they are on the clock. They have to do this fast. There is time limit to this, right? So they have to be efficient. So each one of these emotions, like I'm thinking I have to go fast, or I'm going deeper, it's dangerous in there, or I have to gather everything that I can, the more I can, that's all related to that specific pillar, mining for resources and, and richness. Then we go and list all the features of the games on the right there. And don't, don't care of order. This doesn't have to be associated with anything. I just list the features of the game, right? Um, and you start by, by associating that with emotions. Um, you list on the, bottom, on the top right there what emotions of the players are related to that feature. So for instance, uh, the mule. This game features a robot called the mule that follow the dwarves around and is the inventory. So I collect the resources are going to the mule and deposit in the mule because my, my, my inventory is small. The mule has an infinite inventory, right? So the players can command the mule to go wherever he wants, can tell the mule to go there and wait for me, or come here that I'm going to put things inside. It's a very powerful feature, and it, it defines the game. If you play the game, the mule is super cool, it's everywhere, and it's helping you throughout the game. And this is for, why it has four associations. It touches on at least four emotions that are related to the pillars, right? Another feature is, is that certain ores can heal you, and certain ores can give you uh, um, can give you upgrades, right? It's a good feature, but not as powerful as the mule. And it makes sense, because I can give healing to the player some other way. I can just make him heal over time, right? I take a damage and my heal goes back, like you do in Call of Duty or so on. It's an okay feature, but the mule is more. And this is why that feature only has two associations, while the, while the mule has four. So I now know that this feature, the mule, is more important than that other one that only has two associations, and that allows me to prioritize, or allow me to invest more time in this, or do it first, or make it better, right? And then there is the, 
the seldom kind of rare case where a feature actually contradicts an emotion, which is the case of the second one over there, that every pair has a, a pickaxe, right? Why does it contradict that specific one? Because if every player has a pickaxe, the miner has less of a role. If everybody can mine, the miner is not that important anymore, right? But if you don't have a pickaxe, you can get stuck somewhere and you cannot mine out of that hole. So you need to have the pickaxe. So you, you go on with it, even though it contradicts one of the pillars. But if a feature only contradicts pillars, you should drop it. Or if it contradicts more than one, you should take a lot of care with that. If you pick up a game that you don't like, or a game that has been rated low, like 50% or 40% on Steam, for instance, and you do this exercise, I have done that many times, and I can guarantee you, most of the features will only have one or two associations, or they will have a lot of uh, uh, conflicts with, with the emotions. So this is like a, a box, a, a, a tool that you can put your feature in and ask, is this a good feature to work with? Is it worth spending time and money into making this feature? And you'll get a fairly reasonable answer in the end if you use this candidly. And you do that with your team, right? You ask your team what they think about. Is that, is that the right features? Is that the right pillars? Is that the right emotions? And you work together on this. And I guarantee you, this is worth its weight in gold. So. I will make this presentation available online so you can get the template and use as we wish. Uh, you don't worry that if it's a little bit unreadable here. Right? And with that, I hope you have found a tool, one, one or two tools that will help you make up some games. And thank you very much for your time. And I would like to go to the best part of the presentation, which is questions and free flow, free, free flow uh, chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrique. You're definitely the guy to learn from. And uh, I very much appreciate it. I, I've got lots of my own questions, but I'm sure there are in the hall as well. So please, you're welcome to the mic stand. It's there in the middle. Anyone have a question? Come on. It's the greatest presentation that's been oh, up Alex. to date. <laughs> OK, Alex, you go first. Uh, hey, Enrique. Um, so, question for you. When um, you start the new game design, right, uh, typically it becomes, you know, like, a, like uh, a lot of ideas in a document. How do you make sure that uh, these kind of templates are, or should they be where you start? Um, essentially, what is step one when you come up with a new idea? Like the bare bones, like step one. That's an excellent question because everyone will have a different way of coming up with an idea, right? Sometimes it's a dream, sometimes it's a world, sometimes it's a story you want to tell. Um, I think in game design in two, actually, streams. One, which is the content designer who wants to tell a story, who wants a script, who wants the player to go through certain emotions, are completely controlled. And that would be what games, I would use that example, would be Uncharted, The Last of Us, or things like that, right? The other is the mechanic designer, who thinks about pieces of mechanics that interact with one another and create something bigger than that. Th those are very different things. And there will be a different start for each one of those. So if you are making a game like Uncharted, etc., you will have to start with the narrative and the story and the world. And then you will have to go through the mechanics that fit that world. Right? I don't make those games myself uh, for many reasons. On this side here, where you, you go through the mechanics, you got to think about the emotions that you want to invoke on the player. I want the players to be challenged, or I want the players to be relaxed, or I want the players to be building something, I want the players to be uh, uh, collecting something. What is it that you want the players to do on the core game loop? And then you start creating mechanics around that core game loop with that pillar in the middle. That's how I would do it. I would elect the pillar, put it right in the middle, and start placing mechanics around those, that or those pillars. I will not write a game design document until at least the main features of those mechanics are in prototype and I can play it and I find cool. In the example of Room of Doom, for instance, before we had the controls, there was no game design. The only document we had was what are all the features that the control has to have. Like Coyote time, if I jump out of this, how long do I stay in the air before I drop? Or how, long, how far do I, do I jump? How, what happens if I bounce out of a wall? So that was what you call the design feature. But it was all design document, but it was all related to one feature. 
which is moving the character around. Right? Um, so it, it depends, but I will always, always, always start with the features. And once I'm happy with the core features of that game, if it's Minecraft, it's, I have a block and I, I chip at it. If it's uh, a Deep Rock Galactic, I dig into the ground. Or if it's Tetris, it's a piece falling. Only after I have prototyped that, I will start writing a game design document, and I will test each one of the features that are put into that document before I go further. Okay, follow up to that on the example of uh, Deep Rock Galactic. Uh, I also spent a little bit of time in it. Um, it is a procedural game, though, right? And how do you apply like the heat map example to a procedural game? Or what kind of tools would you use to define what people do in procedural games? That, that's a very good question. Uh, um, procedural games, all the levels are generated in real time, and they're never two levels like each other but they are still created from a common seed. There is something that generates that game. So for instance, uh, uh, the wall or the, the big boss inside that, uh, inside that procedural place will have a seed that will generate it, right? So with that seed, you can replicate that level. So what I would do in the case of Deep Rock Galactic is that I would do heat maps on the procedural and I will overlap the reds or the things. Let's say the players are dying or the players are immobile, they don't go, let's say the players are, the players are dying because it's, it's, it's easier. Um, the players are dying. So this level is completely different from this, right? But there will be a red on this level where the players are dying, and there will be a red on this other level where the players are dying. And those two reds will probably be the same thing. Will be either a rock that is too hard to break and the players cannot get through and they get smashed for something coming from behind, or is a big boss, or, or is a big wave of aliens coming after you, or something like that. The same can be done for you get stuck. I'm not moving. The, the, this, this cube is very hot because the players are not getting out of this cube, so they're stuck in there, right? There will be something about that area that you will see in other levels that are procedurally generated as well. So you, you've got to create an algorithm that amalgamate those red cubes and tell you what is in common with those red cubes. Great. So after this Q&A clash of two CEOs, I think we still have some questions. Yes, please. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to ask is uh, every game designer is kind of a unique person and has a unique perspective on the games. Uh, is there a way for you to validate that you cho have chosen a right pillar for the game? Yeah. In yeah. The, like, uh, I have an example. Uh, I used to play Dark Souls in single player mode, and so I basically skipped this first pillar, or have never thought that it's a core pillar of well, the game. Well, kind of, right? <laughs> you, you, you still have uh, uh, Solaire and the yep. other NPCs you could, you could summon. Sure, sure. Right? Uh, so that, that, that's it. Um, the spirit is still there. Right? And the game is still, even though you don't play like that as a player, which is absolutely fine, mm -hmm. uh, there are mechanics that can replace the players, right? Um, and, and they could have done something different. They could make it so that if it's just one player, the boss is easier to fight and so on. It's not what they chose, mm -hmm. and I understand why they did that. But back to your own question, or the original question is, how can you validate that you're choosing the right pillar? You can't. <laughs> right? Nice. The best you can do is to ask those around you. Mm -hmm. That is my advice. Um, but the better designer you are, the more accurate your pillars will be. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, game design, we're dealing with emotions, player emotions, right? And player emotions are subjective. Emotional work is a subjective yeah. subject. Subjective subject. <laughs> anyway, it is, it, it's just like asking a good film director, like, Tarantino or so on, right? he, he can tell, tell you the techniques. Oh, I put a lot of food. Every film of mine, people are eating food in some, other, in some particular way, and that, the way that they eat the food will inform you a lot about their personality. Right? Every Tarantino movie, th there will be a feat, right? <laughs> there will be food, there will be some sort of violence, and, and each one of those elements is very peculiar to him. Well, when you try to, to convey what, is, what are the emotions I'm trying to evoke by having a foot being shown on the, on the film, is that he knows, I don't. <laughs> so you, you, you've got to cultivate that as a game designer. And if you feel uncertain, which is absolutely fine, seek help, talk to other people around you. Mm -hmm. More often than not, a developer or an artist will, will have an opinion about it and will enrich your perspective and lead you in the right direction. Okay, cool, thank you. Thank you, welcome. Great.
And I have a follow-up question about the core pillars, game pillars. Uh, how many do you think are sufficient enough to start building your design? I, I usually work with three or four. Some Great games, number. some games, you can have more, but I call them sub pillars. If you need, if your game is too complex, right? But the core pillars are usually three or four. Cool. Um, any other questions, please? Okay, then it's my time. So we'll start with this one. Okay. So 300 prototypes. At least, yeah. How do you choose? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Uh, we do game jams every month. We stop for two days and do a game jam. And sometimes we skip a month and then we do four days. And sometimes we go to somebody else's game jam, like global game jam and so on. But 10% of our time is invested in jamming. Um, there are a few rules to those jams. Like uh, if your idea is so bad, you cannot get one other person to work with you. Your idea is, is terrible. Drop it and go work with somebody else. And you've got to finish with something playable at the end of the 48 hours or any other period that it is. So through the years, uh, when we first did the game jam, um, we got everybody in the studio to form teams and create games, etc. We were super excited at the end of the jam. It was terrible, right? Every single game that we created was just, oh my God, we wasted this time. And we stuck with it. We did it again next month. And that time, the results were even worse. And it took like six months for us to actually get the hang of it and understand that we have to tame our ambitions. Um, we have to create tools that we live there, reuse stuff. Artists no longer try to create models. They just go in the asset store and buy them. But before, they were modeling it in 48 hours. They will never finish it, right? So we get to it. And then we ended up creating this incredible number of prototypes. Most of them are garbage. But the ones that are very good, we know immediately. I don't know why that is. We don't need a methodology. We do validate after that, right? So uh, full disclosure. So when we create a, a game jam and we end up with prototypes and we like them, uh, this, is a good, this is a good one, this is a good one, we actually spend time on that prototype and then we take it to players. We have a website called a Bossa Presents that we put prototypes there. People download, they play them. And then we get hard data. We get all the heat maps, we get the DAUs, we get all that. So we know if people are actually liking the game or not. Um, but no game goes to that stage that we don't feel that is good. And it's usually unanimous. That never, ever happened that a prototype was made on a game jam, that someone wanted it to go forward, but he was the only person doing that. It's always everybody, that is the game we have to make, or nobody cares. Do you think it's a, it's a good mindset that if everyone's... Uh like agree on this particular prototype, it's a good one, definitely. But if there is like, I don't know, half and half, uh, so maybe it's a good one or maybe it's a bad one, but there are different reasons and we can tell which was uh, the most influencing because people are different. Yeah, as I said, there isn't that many cases where there was a kind of a split between people wanting to make a prototype and people not caring about it. Right? Usually people say, this is great, everybody, or no one. Another good indication is that just work on it in your spare time if you want it, right? I never seen anyone doing that, right? They, they know themselves that it, the prototype, the idea was great in their heads, but when they created the game, the idea wasn't that great. This, more often than not, the ideas I have in my head when I design them and I test them, they're not good, right? It's, uh, that, that's what game jams teach us, to be humble with it and not be too precious about your ideas because most of them are terrible. Yeah, that's, I think, the, the biggest flaws in modern game designers who are very close to their ideas and they, they feel real pain when they have to, like, trash it because it doesn't work. So, maybe any questions? Sure, go on. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really interesting. And my question is, do you somehow classify the pillars on some types, like pillars about narrative, about gameplay, somehow else? So I didn't quite get the, 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 the start of the question. Uh, did you classify uh, pillars on some types? Ah, yes, sometimes we do. Um, so. It's not necessary to have a pillar of each. But on the, the case of Deep Rock Galactic, there was a pillar that was about the theme of the game, one that was the core mechanic, one that was the nature of the gameplay, and one that was the achievements, and, uh, and so on. 
but it, it could be anything, really. And you, you shouldn't have all of them of the same type, unless it is, a, 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 say, a walking simulator or a linear narrative game. In that case, it, it will be pretty much all of your pillars will be uh, about the narrative and about what your, the story you were telling, right? But, but that's a very specific kind of game. Usually, each pillar will be in, in a different realm. And if, if your intention is to make a rounded game, which is design-wise is, is, is more broad than just one segment, like a walking simulator, right? But if you want something broader, uh, usually you will have different types of pillars. And you can tell if that's your intention and all your pillars are in just one type, either you make a mistake or, or the game is not going where it should go. Make sense? Uh, maybe what types uh, you use usually? Oh, what types I use usually? That's a good question. Well, I always use the type of uh, the game concept, right? In, in the case of Deep Rock Galactic is the setting. What are they doing? Why are they doing? Then I go into um, the game, main game loop, which is the main activity that they do. I go on the nature of the game. Is it PvE, PV, PvP? Is it competitive? It is single player, is multiplayer. And then I, I go into something which is less relevant, but is still touches all, all the trees. Right? That, that's how I usually think. I, I, I don't like to have two of the same type. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Um, any other questions? We still have some time, so it, the, the mic is still open. Okay, my time again. So I wanted to talk about the motivation because you were circling around mostly intrinsic motivation and it's a, it's a good topic. I love UX and uh, cognitive biases and stuff like that. And I wanted to know, uh, what do you think about your mad colleague, <laughs> Richard Bartle, and his system? Or maybe you stick to more modern things like Nick Yee's Quantic Foundry? I, I love the Bartley model. Um, when he created uh, uh, Ultima Online, that's the same Bartley we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make sure. When, when he created Ultima Online, which was the grandfather of all MMOs, right? Um, he established these four models, which is the achiever, uh, the, the explorer, the maximizer, and... The killer, uh, the achiever, the collector, um, the socializer. Yeah, the socializer. So he created those four realms, and everything that he made for that game had to balance out against those type of players, because it was a very broad game in terms of audience. So if he, if he didn't have that, he could end up making features for just one type, and the other three wouldn't have fun, right? So you had to serve the people who just want to hang around and talk on the game. You want to uh, uh, satisfy the people who are hunting things and, and maximizing and killing things, or the people who are just want to craft, or the things, people who just want to collect and maximize. So you, you have to balance the features and content of the game to satisfy everybody. That model persisted for a long time and is a very rich model. But it, is, it was made for MMOs. It was made for a very particular experience. And what I saw game designers doing over time is applying that model to everything. So I, I think that you have to come with your own model, just like Bart, uh, Bartley came with his. Uh, um, understand your game, understand who you're making your game for, which is usually more than one type of person or one type of motivation that that, that, that group of people will have and slice your game into that, right? That will probably talk back to the pillars, but not necessarily. That is more a content roadmap or a feature roadmap and say, I'm satisfying everyone here. But I think it's an incredible tool for design. Yeah, but more for content as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem with Bartles is that he strictly distributes players to these categories. And uh, we know that we are humans and we like to change rules, we want to shift from one thing to another and it's yeah it's true we shouldn't make features just for one this particular category but we should take them in mind so we have just a few minutes i think and my last question because no it's not my last question it's yours hi thanks for the great talk um i do ux research and since we touched upon uh, methodologies and players types, um, I wanted to ask, do you rely on self-determination theory as well? <laughs> Sorry, what was that? It was about the self-determination theory. You know, about relatedness, autonomy. Ah, okay. So Have you heard of it? It's a bit to do with uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivations to do something? 
Well, that's a theory that uh, tells that uh, to make a person happy, he should uh, feel uh, three... Relatedness, autonomy. Yeah, uh, and the he last should one. be happy in three dimensions. One of them is uh, competence, that ah. he's able to do something. He feels that he's like qualified enough. And the second is um, autonomy, uh, when he feels that he uh, he has a choice. Uh, Control. Yeah, and the third is relatedness. That well. I guess it's uh, also more to online games because it's a social component. Not you, you can socialize with NPCs in the world around you, yeah. right? Or stories yeah. that yeah, being told. Yeah, that's, and that, that's absolutely fine. You know, I heard about that, but the reason why I'm not so familiar is because that is a, a derivative from the Maslow pyramid of needs. And it, it, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's directly attached to that. And the Maslow has a little bit more, I don't know, meat on the bones. Right, with, with the self-actualization and so on. Because when we are making games, you're absolutely right. You are trying to satisfy people, get through an emotional journey, whatever that journey is. And when they're going through that journey, the motivations are intrinsically given to them by the game. Like you have to go there and kill something. Or extrinsically, right? I decide where I want to go now. I want to do a side quest, I want to do that, and so on. Um, that methodology is very useful. That is something less of a methodology in my head and something that you as a game designer has to have embedded in your conscious all the time. You've got to understand what the player wants. You've got to understand how to give it to them. And when you're using that tool, when you're using the Maslow pyramid or, or, or any other similar tool, you have to understand that you've got to work on a senoid, which is you want to give them what they want, then you've got to take it away. They have to struggle for it, then you've got to take it away. It's, the, the emotion has always, there's a senoid that goes up, but it's always a senoid. If you have it flat, and you're trying to give everything to the player. But if I ask a player on an MMO, what do you want? They're going to tell me, I want a bigger weapon. Right? I want a bigger sword. And you give them the bigger sword, the game is ruined for them. Because they now don't have any challenge anymore. Yeah, like a carrot that they should follow all the time. Exactly. So, yeah, it is a powerful, it's a powerful asset for any game designer. Uh, understanding the Maslow Pyramid or, or an equivalent. Um, and it's something you have to have awareness and context with everything you do. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you. And we're done. Thank you very much, Enrique. Thank you for thank you. Thank you. the whole.